Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick, and it's time for this week's Friday Morning GM with co-host Vas Laricos. Vas, how you doing? Doing great, Ken. Really enjoying the holiday season. Really enjoyed that terrific uh, Ravens win against San Francisco on Monday night. Yeah, one-sided, just the way we like them, and mm-hmm. uh, and lots of litmus testy goodness coming out of it. Lots of narrative flipping that will happen. That will last at least until Sunday at 4 p.m. Probably, <laughs> or, or maybe <laughs> maybe even a little bit before that. But but uh, if the if the Ravens are able to pull off another, I think uh, it lasts at least until they play a postseason game. A couple things have come out and uh, GM wise that we want to talk about uh, uh, here today. The first is Brian McFarlane, excellent tweet out there about a fairly substantial amount of NLTBE. Um, payments are going to have to be made after this season. Now, NLTB are not likely to be earned. They are um, components of salary incentives that are that are built into um, uh, contracts that are made to sweeten deals for players. And when they get earned, then then you have to pay them out of the following year's cap. So there's a deferral in, involved in that. Um, and we don't have to go into all the all the other details about them because one, I don't know them, but but second of all, the the uh, I, I know you 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 are limited in terms of how low you can set an NLTBE goal, meaning he has to have not met it in the previous right. year. But right. talk a little players, bit about it. Jadavian Clowney, I know uh, Brian estimates, has reached his incentives, as has Michael Pierce, as has Geno Stone, quite a few other players. Uh, Brian estimates between 6.4 and $9 million, uh, to be a negative adjustment on the 24 cap, which uh, by Daniel Rees' uh, calculation – um, leaves the effective cap space at about four million before practice squad hmm. or draft picks or in season contingency. So, um, you know, we got that the news, I believe it was two weeks ago, that it looks like the cap was not going to be as high as previously estimated. And now, with this, uh, it does certainly going to impact the Ravens, just make that a little bit tougher to uh, to field that team, a championship caliber team again next year. Uh, we, you you made uh, uh, a good point, I think, in the last episode. We certainly discussed it that by lowering the cap by a few percent, you know that 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 it's ha- that it seems to have happened league wide. The teams mm-hmm. that are tight on cap space are the most impacted by that. Teams that have a lot of cap space, they love hearing that their cap mm-hmm. space has been reduced to uh, you know ten million or something, because uh, in relative sense, they're a lot wealthier. Absolutely. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Anyway, this this is a uh, this is obviously very bad news for the Ravens in terms of of what's going on. Not wholly unexpected. Was Odell Beckham in the group as making any of his incentives? I think he uh, got about. I think he hit one of his million. I think it was two million possible to be earned, and Brian said he already hit one of them with his yardage and reception totals. Okay. All right. Um, it is what it is. We knew that we knew a big hit was coming from twenty four anyway for him, basically on, on the void years. Um, this obviously changes a lot about what the Ravens can do with money. I mean, effective cap space, when you mentioned that number, I do want to uh, kind of lay that out for people. You mean after 53 are signed at the minimum level. That's what the effective cap space is, I believe. So it's for the, the, the 4 million. You might have 36 players under contract or something right now, but you have to plan mm-hmm. to have 53, which means you need to sign 17 more at kind of minimal contracts. So per Dan's uh, spreadsheet that I'm looking at here that he updated today, um, by the time the incentives met are paid out, which is he estimates at about $8 million and about a little, little bit of dead money um, versus the carryover, basically he's saying that the – if you restructure by the time you factor in practice squad signings, in season injury replacements, practice squad elevations, 2024 20, draft picks, and roll of 53 offsets, the Ravens are in the red by 22 million. Um, that seems high to me, but uh, there's a lot of, as we've been going over the show, all these maneuvers and elevations and signing this guy and in, uh, this player goes to IR and you have to replace him. Um, on the bright side, with basically restructuring all the big, all the, the big five contracts, all five of them, they can uh, they can come out in the in the green about twelve million. 
about 12 million. That's still not a lot, honestly. Um, right. It, it, it almost means that they can't really live with a franchising of Matabike from what I'm, from what I'm hearing there. And I will see how that yes. plays out. Um, but they may, they may just not have the, the money to, um, from there. that is very disappointing because some of the optionality of, of that would have been a tag and trade possibility and whatnot. Uh, so now maybe the only way to deal with it is to, is to sign him to a contract before he's tagged. Um, which doesn't give you as many as many options that you can use. That was the exact thought I had. There is a lot of maneuverability, um, and, but again, to lock in that Matabike at the franchise tag amount, it looks like they would really have to uh, go beyond um, their normal amount of deferring money, just beyond a comfortable level, it seems, based on these numbers. Mm-hmm. Well, this is interesting. Obviously, they have some deals they could do with Boyd years and whatnot. They're not completely out of options in terms of what they can do. But Dan, in particular, I highly recommend the work of Dan Reese. Um, uh, he has at DP Reese eight um, on on Twitter, if I recall correctly. Mm-hmm. If, if, if exactly. Out. Yeah, but he uh, uh, he has a great visualization of salary cap, and Brian knows the nuances like nobody. But but Dan creates these great visualizations of cap that break it into four components. One is like a money that is already spent and you can't do anything about it. And then there's other portions that are restructurable in certain ways. And uh, it, it's a it's an outstanding way to look at cap in terms of the flexibilities, poten- flexibility potentially that a team has. So highly recommend his work. And I don't know if he posts that anywhere, but if he doesn't, I'll offer to post it uh, uh, post it on my site. I'm sure he'll send you the spreadsheet if it's not out there somewhere where, where it's a you know a shared document. Yes, yeah. So this is based off of 38 players under contract. Mm-hmm. Uh, that are accounting for 235 million versus the cap of 242 million. And then all the adjustments from there, uh, whittle that down. And, you know, as we've been saying, they're going to lose quite a few uh, UFAs this year. Uh, On the bright side, one of the ways to replace some of that production is by in-house development. And Mm -hmm. I think we've seen some really positive development from some of the younger players the players, I think you usually consider them the uh, the young producers. Yep. Um, I, I think we've had quite a few, and one, one stands above all to me. But uh, let's let's discuss that because I think we want to uh, you know put some uh, some positivity on it instead of uh, you know always being so concerned when you have a player that you draft and he enters year three or year four and becomes a starting caliber player or even an above average. And you don't have to put that that uh, outlay or draft picks or uh, salary cap. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's let's talk about those guys. So these are all guys on their first contract. Um, if they're in year four currently and not a first round pick, I said, okay, they they they're, they've graduated from this group effectively. I did have one exception, and we'll get to him in a in a, in a while for 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 reasons that are specific to him. But all these players uh, showed, I think, positive development this year. We'll just kind of go through them one at a time. And the first one, fairly obvious, the Ravens' number one draft pick this year, Zay Flowers. Yes, I think he has become a, a bona fide wide receiver one, a low end. You know, he's not a Jamar Chase or Justin Jefferson, but forty percent, almost forty percent target share in the San Francisco game. Uh, product, productive, being utilized in a variety of ways. So that hypothetically lessens your need for maybe a strong wide receiver three or wide receiver four because you already have that wide receiver one um, pr- producing at a wide receiver one level. Yards per target, not what I think Ravens fans would have hoped for at this point from Flowers. A lot of the offense – because of what's been going on with Stanley, because of some of the shortening of the passing game that naturally occurs when you're winning games and you try and create an extension of your run game to close out games, they, they've they've really lowered his yards per target a lot. And in particular, the last four games, he's at just a shade under five yards per target. It's like 4.99. Um, th- that's just not acceptable. I mean, he, he needs to get more deeper targets um and uh and i i just it, that's a, it's a very underutilized resource and a four game period is not a short period for for really looking at that um last year uh two years ago i guess it happened to marquis brown a fair right, amount right and and down the stretch and a lot of that was huntley being in at quarterback and needing to scheme the ball out quickly down the stretch with all the tackle problems they had but um you know this year they're they are feeling some of that again in terms of needing to get the ball out quickly 
I would agree. I would agree. Um, he seems to be the hot route target on a lot of plays. Um, just those little inbreakers or, yeah, as you said, uh, you know, the depth of target is not where it should be. Mm-hmm. Let's move on to number two. Really, one of the really exciting, fast-moving growers is Hamilton. Uh, that 22 draft is looking fantastic right now with Hamilton and Linderbaum in the first round. We'll talk about him next um, mm-hmm. and others as well from that draft. But uh, but Hamilton uh, really a little bit lost in the first two games of his rookie season, came on to have a very fine rookie season once he moved to uh, slot corner in particular. Mm-hmm. This year he's been great all over, um, really been fantastic, I think, when he's been playing close to the line of scrimmage. Uh, it just happens that Ravens have had injury after injury, whether it's him or somebody else, that have forced them to move him back off the line of scrimmage. It's been frustrating as hell, this game of whack-a-mole they're trying to play with right. their slot corner and safeties to, to, to keep a healthy group out there. Yes, Kyle Hamilton has become – an all pro caliber player this year. And I think, uh, you know, compared to where we were entering this season versus his play this season, I think we're in pretty much agreement that we would like to maintain that nickel flexibility um, when they are nickel, that he can be the big nickel going forward. Um, so we thought, I, at least I thought, I'll speak for myself, that cornerback was a very, very big need um, coming into this season. But with Hamilton, I think assuming that role in the nickel, um, the cornerback might be a little bit less and safety might be more, a little bit more of a need. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, the Ravens have shown an unbelievable ability to find cheap safety talent. So it does it. You don't have to draft another first rounder. Hamilton was a, a franchise player that dropped right in their laps, mm-hmm. much in the same way Derwin James did in 2018. And and they, <laughs> they actually made the selection in, in, in 22. Um, I, I just, it, the kind of player you can't say no to. Um, so anyway, if, if I, we'll, we'll see what happens this year, you know, the, the Ravens obviously in a huge need at left tackle, um, to draft somebody, whether it's a, it's a whether it's a one-year project or, or sorry, an immediate starter or a two-year project, they need somebody at left tackle. The, the issue is that, um, that usually takes a very high round draft pick. And I wonder if the Ravens are going to have more, are going to be more driven by need in this coming draft with some very large holes to fill. I, I believe so. I believe this may be uh, the test, the BPA, uh, put it to its test because the positions they need are pretty much all premium positions. And those are the teams that are, those are the players that get pushed up the draft board, sometimes uh, unwarranted um, above their, their grade. And if the Ravens are going to dip into that market, they might need to reach a little bit. All right, let's keep going down the list. We'll go to Linderbaum next. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously having a great year, a huge improvement as a pass blocker. He did not have a particularly great pass blocking game against the 49ers. Javon Hargrave gave him a lot of trouble um, in this one. But generally speaking, huge improvement going from the bottom of the league as a pass blocker to one of the better pass blockers in the National Football League among the centers. Uh, extraordinarily good thing. And it's always good to have linemen who establish a, a, a good baseline for themselves as a rookie. I think this is a new establishment of, I don't know if it's completely a baseline, but it probably is in his second year that he still has improvement to harvest in terms mm-hmm. of what he's doing. Um, some of, There is part of me that's, that's saying, um, because we've seen some regression in the recent weeks, that he's maybe not going to be able to retain 100% of his improvement as a pass blocker. And also, he's up towards the top of the league now. So it'd be, it'd be, it might be more difficult for him to do that. Re- regardless, though, I think there's other ways in which he can improve and be a steadying influence on this offensive line for at least the next two to three years. Completely agree. He's up to PFF's number fifth graded center, number five in pass protection. I think he's really improved his anchor and potentially, I mean, some guys can't carry as much weight. Uh, they really work hard to carry with well, a look at Mark Marshall Yanda after retirement. Mm-hmm. To, for an example, maybe he was in a place where he could bulk up through the off season as, as the season has worn on, he's had a hard time maybe keeping that strength. Uh, but as he gets older, like a, every male mammal, <laughs> they, mm-hmm. they gain strength pretty much. Um, so, yes, I think Tyler Linderbaum is certainly the, the anchor at the pivot, and potentially his improvement in pass protection here may allow the Ravens to go a little bit cheaper at one of the guard spots. Yeah, or or it might even be both, honestly, next year, given their mm-hmm. salary cap position, but I agree with you. Let's move on. Travis Jones, 
big step forward this year. Now, that wasn't he was a good player. Again, great baseline as a rookie, very happy with what he did, but a big step forward as a pass rusher. We've seen it even more in recent weeks. So, you know, it's not a, a, a case of hitting the wall for a young player and it's, you know, the season is just too long for him. He's basically been healthy the entire year. I'm trying to what I'm trying to remember if he missed any time at all, but I don't think so. And so he, he's uh, he's just been very effective um, as a pass rusher, as a run defender, and that's exactly what the Ravens needed, exactly what they needed. Completely. He would be one of the biggest uh, positive developments this season. We had a high opinion of him entering the season, and he has lived up to that tremendous, tremendous game against the 49ers, uh, even rushing from five tech and beating uh, tackles with inside moves. That was outstanding. I think he is developed into – at least a capable third defensive lineman on a depth chart and possibly a, a second defensive lineman heading into the 24 season. Well, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't like to to just lay it out that way. I just say, think he could potentially be a, a, a have another breakout next year if they're willing to um, move him to more three tech play. Now, basically this year he's mostly played nose and it's been him or Pierce. Uh, there's no reason why it can't be him and Pierce, but there's also a, a Pretty good possibility Pierce is allowed to walk, particularly if he gets a good offer anywhere else. And if that yeah. happens, they're going to need him at nose tackle uh, again to be the, the 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 primary guy there. I think there is a there's a penetrator there who could be very effective from that three tech spot. Right, and I think that may be in their best interest if Matapike does depart um, to have Jones's three tech because it's a lot easier to find a nose uh, either yes. draft or you know in the uh, free agency than it is to find a three tech. Completely agree. Completely agree. So they, there'll be a lot of uh, there's always a lot of UDFA noses who are still out there at the end of the mm-hmm. draft. It's it's pretty much the only defensive line position where there are leftovers. Um, mm-hmm. you know, available in the UDFAs. All right. Um, well, another guy who's broken out these last four weeks in the absence of Mark Andrews is Isaiah Likely. Uh, you know, b- big uh, positive news. Obviously, he's averaged over 10 yards per target these last four weeks, and it's not on a small number of targets. It's like 23 for 238 or something. Yeah, played great. Pretty much getting right up to the same snap volume that Mark had when he was at, and producing pretty much comparable numbers. Um probably more yards after the catch based than contested catches downfield. But but he certainly made uh, quite a few impressive contested catches downfield as well. Um, really looking like a strong player moving forward as a viable tight end two and a player that could be a, a starter in, you know, 12 in uh, 12. Yeah. Well, uh, I, you know, one of the things talked about is that Mark Andrews might be back this year. Okay. And if he did, He's he's going to be not 100% Mark Andrews. So if he does come back, I think, you know, pitch counting him and keeping likely in a rotation, we might learn a lot about how much the Ravens really want to slant usage to either player and still slant targets to either player um, when they're in usage because the down and distance situation in the game script is going to determine whether they're passing or not. But they, But in, in terms of uh, you know, the targeting, are they still going to target likely a fair amount to try and get first downs, uh, you know, on, on, on key high leverage plays, you know, third and third and four, third and eight kind of thing. Right. That's how I would, I would probably reserve Mark's snap limited uh, pitch count, snap count to red zone and, and, you know, high leverage third downs. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that likely can also be on the field for them, but uh, that's how I would like to see it. But yeah, likely again, um, He's exceeded my expectations. I wasn't quite sure if he was going to be able to fill in as seamlessly when Mark went down, and he's exceeded them. High-value player regardless. The Ravens should find a way to to get value out of a player like that. We go down another another one, and and the saddest story in terms of an injury this year is to Keaton Mitchell. Um, Unbelievable rookie year. And, And, folks, if you're not appreciating for what it is, I know you've probably heard me talk on blue in the face, but he's got 47 carries and the highest DeVoa of the entire DeVoa era for anyone with 40 plus carries. Hmm. Uh, Devon Achan was right next to him. Achan actually dropped with a 3.4 yard per carry game this last week uh, to a lower DeVoa. Uh, success rate is amazing. All the stats are amazing. Uh, DeVoa, uh, success rate, all that. And in fact, the, the, the Ravens, backs have been tremendous in terms of the 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 key um um 
analytics metrics, EPA and success rate, they've been very high on. Um, and I look at that Dolphins team. This will, this will shock the hell out of you, I think. There's only three teams in the National Football League, by the way, who have a positive EPA per play on run plays. The Ravens okay. are one of those. And I forget if they're one or two, but they're they're in the top two. The Miami Dolphins, all the speed they have, Mostert at 4.8 yards per carry, HN, HN at 7.5 or thereabouts. Uh, that's most of their carries right there. What do you think their EPA per play is on the, with the run? Um, maybe a quarter point. Negative 0.12. Oh, and wow. I was like, how the hell did that happen? I thought, thought for sure they'd be one of the three teams if anybody just told me right. that. But, sure. but, uh, but no, apparently they've been very bad situationally, and they've had a lot of uh, failed – a failure to pick up third down and third and short kind of thing. And hmm. Mostert and, and, uh, and, and HN, HN are great home run hitters, but um, you know, have a, have a lot of variation. Of course, defense loves variation and outcome. So you, you uh, uh, get a better result. That I just, I was shocked by that. Took so who are the other two? Do you recall, recall the other two? I think it might've been Philly? Detroit. Possibly, I think I think it was Detroit, and it, and it may have may have excluded things like quarterback designed runs or quarterback scrambles. Okay. Um, but I think Detroit was one of them. I'm trying to think of who the other one was, but uh, it was on a chart. It'll come up again, and I'll, I'll forward it to you when it does. Okay. But, uh, but it's just an interesting thing. But anyway, Mitchell, fantastic rookie year. He, he, he's such an enormous loss, and I'm I am. He's the one player that I'm really concerned about his 24 future, probably his future in general, but his 24 future for sure, given how late in the season this injury occurred. Yeah, apparently he had surgery today, as we record here on the 28th, and they had a picture of him from his hospital bed. Average recovery time, nine months uh, these days for a for a single without the uh, – I forget what Carbo termed it, without – Cartilage damage. Cartilage, yes. So – uh and get back in nine months. I'd put him probably about halfway through next season. But yeah, he's not going to be ready for the beginning of next season. I'd be shocked. Right. Okay. At, uh, and uh, yeah, it just, it's so sad. Um, Adafi Owe, a 21 draft pick. Now, the nice thing, Adafi Owe, I think, has had a fine season and he's been Absolutely. ratcheting up the pressure he's been delivered as he's come back and dealt with some injuries and whatnot. But uh, he's a player, I think, I expect the Ravens to pick up his fifth year option. It will not be that expensive, something somewhere in the $12 million range. Now, I say not that expensive, but 2025, Baltimore is going to have another tight cap situation. Mm-hmm. And it, it you you got to ask yourself does this does this really make sense? That said, I think it's a no brainer in terms of Oway, who will be the only guy they really have left on the edge they can depend on. They'll have a Jabo. He's a lottery ticket at this point. I think we'd agree. Um, they'll have Robinson, who's an up and coming player as well. But I think they they would have to keep Oway. I think so, and this may be at the time to look at a long term extension as a cornerstone player if they can get him cheaper than because I think if he plays next season more snaps, a full healthy season, then his value is going to skyrocket potentially. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'd certainly like to keep him in the house. Um, he's probably been their highest graded against the run out of all their edge defenders this season, and the production has been closer to where it was his rookie year than last year. Yeah. Uh, Tavius Robinson, we just mentioned. Um, what's what's good about Tavius Robinson is he got about 30% of the snaps as a rookie. That's declined this year as the other – Veterans have been brought in to take a higher share of the pass rush snaps, and Oa has returned from injury to to, to take away some of his run uh, down snaps. But he's still in there on some base package stuff. Um, I think they saw him just the other day. They used rush nickel for five straight snaps and had him rushing from the inside, which is about the first we've seen of that this year. I'm not going to say exactly the first, but it's it's pretty much the first we've seen of it. Um, you know that may be something that that he can develop, get a little bigger this off season, and and uh, and become a bigger presence there. But I'm still optimistic about where he could go. I think basically his his first year um, has been you know terrific in terms of, of of his snap percentage. It's a great place to start. Uh, I just I I don't. It's not obvious to me that that he's a player who's going to jump to start him next year. I'm just happy with his baseline. Yeah, I think he's a backup at this point. He has had a lot of trouble beating offensive tackles uh, when rushing the passer. Mm -hmm. Um, Just not very – I mean, I think he had the one sack, what was that, three weeks ago? Um, But just just, uh, hasn't quite got there. But that doesn't mean he can't. He was a developmental player, a young young player at the football. 
Um, so he can develop that. And, you know, you, you need probably five outside linebackers on the depth chart next year. And he's a good outside linebacker five. Yeah. Yep. That's uh, I think that's reasonable and fair. Um, Brandon Stevens, uh, who <laughs> unbelievable year in some ways, the, the, most development of any player, I'd put him right up there with Linderbaum's improvement in pass blocking, has been um, what's happened to Stevens. Uh, we kind of, I think we kind of expected it from Hamilton. I don't know how greedy we were. We were expecting Flowers to be great, but expectations for a number one receiver always are through the roof. And I think that leaves you with Stevens as being the guy who is most above expectation. Definitely, especially because he began training camp as a safety and then moved to the slot. And uh, the Ravens didn't even necessarily have this confidence in him. He's uh, he's played over 1,100 snaps this season, Ken. I, I just looked at it yesterday, including special teams, but 1,000 on defense already. Uh, very high marks, physical player, um, just completely not out of left field because he did have some good, good tape towards the end of last year. But if you have to identify one player that has made the 2024 roster outlook uh, look a whole lot better than it did to start this season, I think it has to be Brandon Stevens. Stevens, 99.2% of the snaps this year leads all Ravens defenders. The only guy who's the only two who are close are Queen and Smith, who are both at 98%. So uh, very, very impressive and Iron Man season he's had on the outside. And um, he is a player that if he stays there, we're going to be fine. You know, it's, it, he, this is his third year and, and, uh, you know, extension would, should be discussed at the end of this year. Cause it's the first chance that you have is after year three, but beyond that, um, he's, he's a player whose versatility might really have hurt him in his first two years. And we've seen a little bit of that Correa and, um, uh, or, uh, or trying to move left and right uh, in terms of their tackle spot. I'm trying to think of some other players who are really kind of hurt by their own versatility at some points. But. Kruger, I would say, probably a little bit. Kofusi, that that's a good one. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, the, the, the point the point is made that that you know you're you're a lot of times you're better off finding that position. I, the Ravens clearly did not have it figured out at the start of this OTAs, for example that he was an outside corner, but he was playing outside corner at his highest level at the end of the year. Most of his penalties had come early. And, you know, it just at some point you ought to make that commitment. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest. I was, I was one of the people who said that, that uh, I didn't really think I, I wasn't really sanguine about the possibility of, about him being the Ravens fourth corner. You know, if you give, right. you, you know, you're three and now Hamilton is the slot and Stevens is the number one corner. Everything has been turned over and, and the Ravens have, you know, effectively no serious depth issue at corner as of this moment. Yes, I was, you know, I didn't wasn't writing him off before the season, but certainly wanted to add competition of Yassine and Darby. And if Stevens was going to become a full time starter, he was going to have to earn it. It wasn't going to be handed to him as, you know, maybe some of the young wide receivers were handed uh, an opportunity two seasons ago, you know, in the 22 season, he earned it. He really did earn it. And you're talking about before the season, we all left the draft saying, why didn't they take a corner earlier? They need they really, really need a corner. You lose Marcus Peters, you have Marlon Humphrey, and that's pretty much it. Um, now you go into look, looking at next draft, and I don't consider that a tier one need anymore. Not necessarily a, yeah. you need to take a first or second round pick. You, you always need corners, but I would put that a little bit lower on that on the probably a tier two need at this point, uh, based solely because of Brandon Stevens' ascension. I like the way that DaCosta puts that in terms of you always need corners. He says they're like pitchers. You just need to be constantly developing them, but so you can so you can have them be available. But they get injured, and and you know it's just. There's no getting around it. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel the same way about running backs right now, too, is that you're you're better off having just a constant you know, yes. treadmill of development and, and probably starting from a lower level, like not starting necessarily from a second round draft pick, but mm -hmm. starting, you know, from a from a fifth round draft pick or an undrafted guy a lot of the time. You know? Yep. Completely agree with that. All right. Now we got another group here. By the way, that's that we should be pretty freaking happy about. That's nine players who have surprised us on the upside. That's a pretty damn good group. But there, there are another group of five players that I labeled as still more needed. All right, so mm -hmm. it's not they've you know 
their development is probably at an okay level for this year or at about the expected level, but, the, but it's not, you know, that hasn't projected them into a starting role or, or certainly into stardom, but uh, we'll talk through those uh, briefly. And, and the first guy on my list is Sala. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, he's been active for, I believe one game this whole season and didn't see the field and uh, really hasn't, you know, he's had some practice reps, obviously, and a little bit of preseason play. But in a way, it is a lost season for him, and he hasn't given you confidence that he's capable of, uh, you know, taking over a starting guard job next year with both your guards and pending UFAs. He needs to be, in my view, part of a probably a three-man competition um, unless you have somebody with a high pedigree that's going to secure one of those spots for sure. You have – you have you have several people who you're who you're looking at right now because the team has Voris, um, who's a mm-hmm. hidden man in all of this. That that we, you know, we don't know exactly what he is yet on, on the field. I, I'm obviously very excited about the prospect of what he is, but um, and then they have Salah, and then they have Ben Cleveland still around in year four. Mm-hmm. So you're gonna you're gonna try and see what he has, and then the next guy we'll talk about is John Simpson. Now he's the mm-hmm. only UFA I put on this list. Why did I do it? I I did it because. Um, he's a young player who I don't think commands any sort of contract right now from another team. I don't, I don't think any other team is looking at him and say, yeah, let's give him $10 million for two years or, or, or right. three years even. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the Ravens get him very cheap. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, he's kind of an ideal fit for the Ravens given the problems he has are, are primarily penalties. Not a great pass blocker, not a great run blocker, but he's good enough to get by and be a pretty good guard if he could cut those damn penalties. And right. I can't imagine there's a team better than the Ravens at being able to correct that. I believe they go all the way back to his days at Clemson. That's just, uh, it hasn't been coached out of him or or he just, maybe he panics when he's somebody's crossing his face and he grabs a hold. Um, yeah, for, for a cheap contract, uh, I think he'd be a terrific addition. I think I like the uh, edge that he plays with, and I also think that he's got a pretty good anchor. Um, he gets beat more, you know, because of his feet are a little heavy, but I think that having a strong interior line – I forget where I heard this somewhere, but having a strong interior line has given Lamar more confidence in the pocket, even though the tackles aren't where they have been in past years. Having a pretty sound, solid trio in the interior – has helped Lamar, uh, you know, just manage that pocket as uh, as beautifully as he has this season. So to give you an idea here, he had, I, I believe, I'm going from the PFF numbers, but he had a penalty every 98 snaps coming to Baltimore, and then he's he's cut that to a penalty every 100.7 snaps in his season here. So <laughs> he's, got, he's got a ways to go still. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's continue on the list. Uh, and I'm going to stick with the offensive line and talk about Daniel Falele right now. Um, it, it's definitely still more needed. And, and Falele, one of the things uh, I, I would have literally one week ago, or let's say 10 days ago, let's say, let's say two weeks ago. Okay, then, then it's, mm-hmm. it's easier. Then it clearly cuts out the last two games. I would have said uh, he was completely a developmental player still. And worse than that, he's a developmental player entering year three. Mm-hmm. Um, which is which is a, not a good place to be because you can only have a couple of developmental linemen on your on your roster. I mean, you want them; they're size and shape positions, but you can't keep them on the practice squad because somebody will take them. And right. you and you, uh, you you can only have a couple that are available. But anyway, the last two weeks he's put together the best forty nine snaps of his NFL career, and right. he's he's a, he's been in the in the low seventies in terms of his grade, which when you adjust for it would be you know a, a, a medium to high C in terms of how he's played. And um, that's, that's such a huge improvement. There's so much technically that still needs to be fixed, but, but th- to see him actually have a little bit of success in, in even over 49 snaps is a nice thing to see. Yes. I think he has become a capable right tackle, a backup right tackle. And I don't think you could have said that necessarily two weeks ago, but he is still hopefully on the trajectory to eventually be able to take over for Moses um, in that final year. Uh, so I have seen definitely agree with you. Positive signs the last couple of weeks. No doubt they keep Moses for next year, right? From in your opinion, absolutely, no question. Yeah, yeah. I, w- I would agree on that. Um, and I think I've I've completely given up on Falele being a guy that can ever move to the left side to play. Um, I think McCary is is probably the the the. Uh, that's 
honestly, you know, I got to be honest about this. McCary is not a guy I really like at left tackle at all, but he's about as good as you can hope to get at a as a backup at left tackle. And then it gives you some other versatility in theory you could use. The Ravens haven't really used him anywhere but tackle this year because their need is so great there that they, they've used Mustafa and others when they need a backup center or uh, need a backup guard. You go to Cleveland or whatever. But, uh, uh, you know, it's it's a the Falele situation. I think he's he's got a the window is narrowed on what he's going to do, you know, the, the role. Um, and, and the time is also kind of running out in terms of him being demonstrating he's ready for that role. I want to see a big preseason from him next year. Of course, definitely. Yeah. Yep. Uh, next thing on the list I have is Bateman. Now, Bateman uh, is a guy whose fifth-year option will come due this offseason, and I don't think there's any way in hell the Ravens pick it up because for a wide receiver, that's going to be a lot of money, and it, it just wouldn't make any sense. They could try and extend him. Um, the, there's been moments, but it's been fits and starts in terms of movement forward in the offense. And the last four weeks without Andrews, um, he's really – it been in a little bit of a downtick in terms of yards per target with just, just over five these last four weeks. Yeah. And too many drops. Uh, he's had a couple of really costly drops this year. I I would say that he's his play this season has been a negative development on the 24 roster outlook. Mm-hmm. Disappointing. I kept waiting for the, for the, um, the breakout game to come and for him to become more involved. And he was dealing with the foot injury in camp and there was a ramp up period. And then Andrews went out and you figure, okay, here's Bateman's opportunity. There were several games that Beckham missed where he had an opportunity and he hasn't, I I think he's taken a step back from where he was uh, in the first half of last season. Um, And that's unfortunate because he and Flowers and Wallace are the only receivers they have under contract for next season. Yeah, so definitely going to be dipping in the draft again into the wide receiver pool. Bateman's going to have to be one of the guys they rely on next year. You know, the the positive thing I would look at, and this is why I didn't have him in the negative group, is if I look at um, some of the other metrics about separation and whatnot, his separation Mm -hmm. numbers are not in any way – fake or phony based on some sort of weird situational thing like catching passes behind the line of scrimmage or jet pitches or something like that. He, he, he runs a route every time he runs a route and he has proven, I think at least that part of his game, which was the reason he was drafted out of Minnesota was his great route running um, has proven to be quite valuable. He's got some real wiggle at the top of the route. Lamar just, and he just need to get on, on, on a connected level to debt that and a lot of his production this year has been on extended plays, which also is great, by the way. We we want that, but but I also want to have something where Lamar has the confidence to go to that he's going to lose that defensive back and go to him at, as the top of the route is being hit. Agreed. They need to next year. He he is going to be relied upon as a wide receiver, too. I think uh, I'd be I'd be surprised if he wasn't. You never quit on talent, but uh he hasn't had a great season. Our Darius Washington, the other guy in this group, kind of another forgotten guy because he got injured so early in the year, but a guy who came into camp and just ripped the starting nickel roll away from all other pretenders. Uh, and that included players like Mallette, who was hurt and you know started the season on the roster, but didn't start as the starting nickel. Uh, that mm-hmm. was our Darius Washington for those first couple of games. Had a sack early on, uh, gave you a lot of that um, Corey Ivy kind of look as, as a very versatile a uh, tenacious downhill um, uh, slot in addition to being a guy who can cover a little and, and certainly mm-hmm. cover in a, in a, in a short zone there. Uh, I, I still have hope for him next year. And, and maybe he's a guy who they make their third down and a long kind of nickel. If they want to move Hamilton off the line of scrimmage on those downs. Yeah. I, I, I certainly uh, co-sign that. I think he does have a role. And he established himself, and, and that would be a very good role for him as a you know the standard nickel slot man um, gets away with his size limitations by playing a physical brand of football. All right, now we get to the third group, which is five guys who time is running out on, and I, they're they're behind the developmental curve at various points in their actual playing career right now. But the first one we'll, we'll talk about is Jalen Armour Davis. Why don't you take first take the lead on that one? Yeah, you know, he was a traits-based, injury-prone prospect coming out of Alabama, and he's pretty much maintained that. He's been banged up pretty much 
almost his whole career. He get he finally gets some playing time above uh, Darby and Yassine two weeks ago. Then he suffers a concussion. Now he's on the shelf for two more weeks. Um, just a, and then it just seems like a never ending string of injuries. Um, he might be that guy that breaks out potentially in the fourth year if he can stay healthy. But um, it, I think he's sort of a a bubble player at this point. <laughs> Well, we'll be entering year three. So, uh, you know, a guy that a lot of people had hope on based on what they saw on campus. And, and he's a long guy, so you like that. He's a he's mm-hmm. a speed guy, so you like that. And he can stay with receivers down the field. Um, but the problem is he has to – uh, more than any other corner on the Ravens, he has to make a choice between trying to find the football and trying to find stay with the receiver. He just cannot <laughs> seem to do it. It's like if you if you if you have to do one of those two and you can't do both, that's a big negative trade. Obviously, some a, a lot of corners in this league they they keep track of the receiver by actually just putting their hand on him, just just mm-hmm. the, the normal hand checking or even even a hand on the shoulder kind of thing where you're not pressing, you're not you're not pushing, you're not doing any of that stuff. Um, you, you keep your hand on the receiver. You, you you keep track of where he is. It's just never been something that JAD has has found to be natural at the NFL level. Yeah, and honestly, Marlon Humphrey didn't have great ball schools when he came out of Alabama. Uh, even Fitzpatrick had some problems when he first came out. Maybe it's something of the of the saving technique, um, but he just he just doesn't have that feel for it, and he's not going to get that feel for it when he's on the. Uh, in the, on the training table, getting uh, treatment all the time instead of taking reps. Yeah. All right, number two on the list in terms of of guys who's we'll start we'll stay at corner and and with Pepe Williams and again another case where injuries have held him back a little bit. But honestly, when he has played, he hasn't been that great. Yeah. Uh, fairly limited in terms of what he can do. He's been a slot corner primarily in the preseason. He's played a little bit of safety, and they ask a lot of people to play safety on the back end to, to relieve tandems as you go through a preseason game. But uh, a guy that uh, it's not exactly opposite. It's not exactly obvious to me going into year three, that he has a good spot that he fits into on the totem pole, which means I think I, I would look at him as being a bubble player next camp. I would as well. Um, a media darling in a way um, be, you know, based off of really his performance at, OTAs his rookie year uh, hasn't done much, you know, played decently okay, I guess, in some games last year. Also had some tough games. So I guess as we're thinking about this, Brandon Stevens has probably lessened the need for a starting caliber corner, but JAD and Pepe, and also not being able to retain Kyrie Blue Kelly, who they drafted, has increased the need uh, for back for for cornerback depth, uh, young cornerback depth in the upcoming draft. Uh, more than more than probably we thought uh, heading into this season. By the way, Caillou Blue Kelly, I believe, has now been cut three times. I need to go ahead and look at that. As if he had a Wikipedia page, which I do not see, that's very unusual for a player. But I believe he's been cut three times already now. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, yeah, a, a, yeah, tough tough draft pick. Obviously, didn't trouble, work out. Trouble pick. Yeah. Trouble pick for the start. Yeah. Uh, next guy on my list is Ben Cleveland. Uh, he'll be entering year four. Um, he, it just has seemed there are as much as Harbaugh loved him on draft day, um, in terms of him being a huge physical presence, he just has not lived up to Harbaugh's, uh, uh, expectations in so many ways, starting with the showing up fat, uh, Mm -hmm. failing a conditioning test. I think, I think he failed the conditioning test. I don't think I'm, I'm missing that, but he, but anyway, he showed up fat (laughs) for certain Mm -hmm. they've, they've, Flagged, they, they listed him at 370 on the roster, which tells me that's, that's almost punitive in terms of, <laughs> of really wanting to tell the rest of the league, look, this guy weighs 370 pounds. Um, mm. What were we supposed to do? You know, kind of thing. But, they, but uh, you know, as opportunities have come up, and there have been a lot of them at guard, you know, the competition really two consecutive years there, uh, he still has not found a way to win it. Right. That's that's true. I do wonder if he's one of those players that are a right side only player um and he's been blocked by Zeitler I do occasionally wonder about that because some players like same with tackles the footwork's different he did play on the right side of Georgia good point I haven't given up on him but you know he's maybe a player that let's see what he can do in week 18 hopefully they get the uh the one seed locked up and maybe and maybe that's uh an indicator of where he where he slots in next year 
Yeah, that, that's a good point. And, and you know, the, the, what, the one thing about the Ravens is that they're not going to have 19 deactivations that they would like to have for, for week 18. They only <laughs> they only get seven or thereabouts. And yeah, I think Zeitler might what might well be one of them, given the kind of the physical struggles he's been through this year. And he's been a warrior. He's been out there the whole time. But uh, but I would agree. Would you would you see, like to see Cleveland at right tackle some of that game or you should like to see him at right guard? I, I, I'd like to see how they finished off this last game with Falele and Cleveland and the and the two uh, twin towers next to each other. I kind of like that uh, that opportunity to, to get your right handed run game going. Yeah, that that'd be a lot of fun and and uh, you know roll over TJ Watt a little bit and uh, I, 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 it's unlikely that the Steelers are going to be headed into the playoffs at that point. If they if they have a chance to, the Ravens would probably love to put them there ahead of just about any <laughs> other team. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but it'd be it'd be also fun to uh, give a little bit of a mauling to TJ Watt, who's certainly injured a lot of quarterbacks in his day. Sure, sure. At Tomlin's uh, streak of finishing 500 or better is in limbo, too. It'd be a real shame uh, if, he didn't, if he didn't continue that, huh? <laughs> well, I, you know, it's a, it, that's a, yeah, you, I probably would like to see it ended, but but on, on the other, if I'm being honest with myself, but on the other side, it's a freak show stat, and I'd rather have a bad team in the playoffs. I would rather have a bad team in the playoffs. And, you know, the Ravens, honestly, they could still end up as the, I mean, they could even lose the division, obviously, but they could certainly still end up as the two seed if they lose to Miami. Um, no, that's it. That doesn't really work out. If they, if they, it's going to be hard for them to get the, they lose to the Miami two seed and play. If Buffalo beats Miami, Buffalo, Miami would still hold the one seed. I haven't looked at that one. Cause I know if, that the, if Miami loses yeah. this week, then the division's on the line. Yeah, so if that's if if Miami um, wins this week, the Ravens still have a chance to get the one seed, but they have to have Buffalo, who will have nothing to play for, go in and win their Week 18 game. And Buffalo, um, it depends on some outcomes this week, but they may be actually locked in at the number six seed, so there won't there won't be anything to play for, and that's uh, that's obviously an unfortunate situation. Ravens really needed Dallas to grow a pair and go in and beat that <laughs> Miami team, but they didn't get it done. Yeah, yeah. The battle of the teams that nobody that didn't have they used to say on the SEC, schedule ain't played nobody. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> schedule ain't played go. nobody. All right. So the last guy I have on the on the time running out list is Charlie Kolar. And and this would be the time for him. The Ravens only have two tight ends active. They have been using Ricard in line a lot, so and not too much at fullback. So that's that's you know, it, it's cutting into his playing time. Uh he's just barely been targeted during this time. Uh, when he has, it hasn't looked terrible or anything. Um, he hasn't been perfect. Had a, he had a, a lot of pressure as I scored it in one of these games recently. Um, it, 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 I, I'm sure it's evident because he only had two pass blocking snaps in the game, and PFF probably gave him a very low score in that game. But uh, but he gave up a pressure in, on on one of the two, and um, he's just a guy. He, uh, you know, the, the, uh, opportunities do not grow on trees in the NFL. You usually ha- initial opportunities almost always come from injury. And I don't know if he's going to get another. Yeah. I'm comfortable with him as a tight end three. And I don't, I wouldn't be in the market to upgrade tight end three. That's coming off season with all three. I believe his run block grade is on par with Mark Andrews per PFF. And I think he's caught well enough when given the opportunity. So I might be a little bit higher on his uh, long-term outlook than you, but I think the tight end room, is is well stocked in the in the short term future. Okay, all right. Well, fair enough. Uh, Tylen Wallace. I, I'm sorry, I don't think we talked about him, did we? Did not talk no, about Tylen Wallace. So he's under contract. You mentioned that I think earlier. Um, is is there a future for him as a receiver? We know he's a valuable special teams player, so he might have a long term future with the Ravens just based on that. Mm-hmm. That's where I was sort of thinking. I think he proved this year. We didn't know that he could become a quality return man necessarily. He hadn't. I don't believe he returned any until the touchdown. Was that the story? Until the big touchdown in the Rams game. So and now you're adding that to his uh, skill set with the, um, you know, Gunner uh, and other special teams work that he does. So he's your your prototypical wide receiver six that plays on offense in an emergency situation and is worth having on the team for his return skills and his other, uh, you know, special teams coverage ability. 
right. I, and I'm all for that. Um, I would love it if he could be more of a Kelly Washington type player who was a reliable third down receiver as yes. well. Um, mm-hmm. That would be a big addition. Or even if they had just a package of plays that were for him, jet sweeps or or some specific route that they like to run to him. Or maybe he becomes you know, a guy like, um, go back to Demetrius Williams and, and some other players who you use primarily as a deep threat. Mm-hmm. Um, if if there was it was some value to that, it, it would just I would feel so much better about it if if Monken could find some specific usage, knowing that he's going to be on the team next year and and get that put in place over the off season. Agree, agree. I'd like to make mention of one more player as well, who's also a UFA, but I believe can be brought back relatively cheaply, and that is Malik Harrison. I think um, you know he came into the season as an inside linebacker, uh, transitioned to an outside linebacker, and he can really thump. I mean, you watch him set that edge, whether it's he's, he's blocking uh, or he's trying to be blocked by a tight end primarily or a tackle. He's going to really thump. He still does have that inside linebacker versatility. So let's say Patrick Queen departs and, you, and, you need, and you're working a platoon system with, the, you know, di- different uh, players, depending on down a distance, he could fill in there. And he has been the special teams captain as far as at least playing that he and Delshawn Phillips are on the most uh, teams. And I think he'd be a good player that can maybe just won't be one of those cheap players that fills out depth and, and has multiple you know, utility at multiple places. Yeah, they've, they've the key there is is getting it done cheaply, and he's a he's a, a roster fungibility guy as well, which is nice. Uh, so he enters his fifth year, he become a vested veteran. He doesn't have to go through waivers at the end of camp, which means you can make a handshake deal with him, get another guy on the roster with uh, uh, you know the, the potential of returning him from IR uh, at a later date. That's something the Ravens absolutely love to do, and. You know, Brent Urban, Daryl Worley, you know, Malik Harrison now, uh, Anthony Levine in the past are all guys that they that they have done that with. And and it makes a lot of sense to uh, to extend the roster. Uh, I am not really believing he'll be in the inside linebacker plans, but I think he's done a lot at outside linebacker that have been specific to the Ravens needs that it, having him there has put them in a position where they uh, eat up some snaps. Whatever they have in terms of edge rushers next year, I expect it to be heavily veteran complemented as well. I expect that whoever they'll get, they'll, they'll probably get a couple cheap cheap veterans as well, one anyway. And that guy will be someone who you don't want out there for a bajillion snaps, uh, whereas Owe and and uh, um, well maybe Owe only among among guys you know from this year um, is a guy you, you you trust to play more snaps. With Harrison, you, you get some early down snaps taken up by a solid run defender. And we saw just in this last game on that first and two play, uh, the 49ers, uh, you know, rolled out. He was, uh, sorry, they, they booted out right. naked zone block left, naked boot, right. And Harrison was completely not fooled. And, and, and his tracking down of Darnold in that situation was, was one of the big plays that kept them out of the end zone. And then they, of course they had a, a sack that he took, uh, well, two plays later, they ran the ball mm-hmm. for one and then they, had, they took the sack. Yeah. We didn't know where his career was headed a couple of years ago where there was an off the field incident. And I think it's, he's really found that role and I'd like to keep him there. And, and that's one less, uh, you know, problem area or one less spot you have to find in the off season. Overall, I think it has been a good year of development as far as in season development. Of course, Ojabo losing the year weighs the, weighs the, uh, the average down. But when you have Stevens, and Owe and Mitchell and Linderbaum and likely and Jones and Hamilton and Flowers, as you said, uh, it's been a, it's been a, a B plus A minus is if you're going to grade uh, the best the best possible outcome of development. I think it's been a good a good year for that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's been a very good year. Um, I, Ajabo was a player that I had forgotten to add to the list, but of course, I mean he's he is I, he would be in the time running out category for me in terms of. Uh, he's he's just a lottery ticket, frankly, at this point. If if it works out, fantastic. But he's lost so much developmental time; it's it's very sad. Mm, yeah, it is uh, nature of the sport, unfortunately. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the injury report this week because the Ravens had a um, intimidating injury report yesterday that came out, and it was just a walkthrough. So they had an, an injury report estimation, and I don't, I haven't yeah, seen anything yet today. Have you seen anything? Not yet, but I can look quickly. Okay. 
Kyle Hamilton has returned to practice today, uh, according to a picture from Kyle Phoenix Barber. And and Roquan Smith is wearing a brace on his chest for his pectoral injury. But it doesn't look like we had the full injury report, but they're just kind of doing, uh, I guess, a couple clips and snaps of of what they can. Gotcha. Gotcha. So the concerning ones are are Zeitler, uh, right, and and Zay. Zeitler and Zay, but it's a very long list. Just go through this. Um, Zeitler, Queen, Smith, Hamilton, Flowers, McCary, Stout, uh, Broderick, Washington, J.A.D., Mallette were all limited or DNP yesterday. And Hamilton, Zeitler, and Washington did not finish versus the 49ers. So I don't know if if, um, uh, Kyle has said whether Zeitler is back today or whether Washington is back today. Uh, But but you need both of those guys, uh, you know, to have your full complement of 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 players for for Sunday. Yeah, I mean, you haven't got a ton out of Broderick Washington this season, but you don't want to be down to four defensive line. There you go. Chance. Um, and then PQ, and you could see it on tape. Um, he he looked like he hurt his shoulder in the fourth quarter. Somebody said they heard him; they could read his lips, and he was saying his collarbone or something. But uh, he would he, he was estimated as limited. McCary, we'll see how the concussion protocol goes. JD still in the protocol, so that must have been a pretty se- severe uh, injury there. And then you uh, guess you hope you get more let back. If you know to, to with Hamilton, would you rest? Would you rest Hamilton, Ken? I mean, they need to win this football game. Is so much riding on it. I would, I would play Hamilton if he can go, and then I'd rest him for two weeks. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't. I'd, I'd be tempted not to practice him in the third week, <laughs> but I would. I'd rest him all the way for two weeks. Yes, yeah. agreed, agreed. You know, tis the season. Everybody's banged up. The 49ers injury report was about twice as long as the Ravens. So, uh, oh, you saw that that's good to hear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I know their they, offensive they, line yeah. was in bad shape. It was. It, it, it was. If I, I just did the Know Your Foe show yesterday with Daniel Oyafosi, who's, a, who's a, a guy who used to be with the Sun. Yeah. And uh-huh. he went through the Ravens' offense, sorry, the, the Dolphins' offensive line. And boy, are they banged up uh, yeah. in terms of who they have left playing. Uh, uh, playing where so the Ravens situation honestly as bad as you know some of the play has been at tackle and whatnot uh it, it, it can get a lot worse <laughs> indeed indeed so Kevin Zeitler I guess is the main one who I would be concerned about and yeah. you know he needs a flowers too to match uh their chunk playability yep absolutely uh one other thing that happened today uh Russell Wilson uh benched by the Broncos in what is effectively a salary move. The Broncos approach Wilson and and want him to um, remove a uh, injury trigger or defer an injury trigger in his contract that would create a, a, a some huge amount of money, 37, 39 million of additional guaranteed money uh, mm-hmm. if he gets hurt. And so the, the Broncos are unhappy with Wilson despite a, a fine statistical season. Um, they're unhappy with the with the way their offense has performed. Can't completely disagree with that, certainly. Um, but they they wanted to um, uh, sit him on the bench largely because of the injury risk the next two weeks, which would trigger an enormous additional payout. So uh, interesting interesting set of circumstances there in terms of uh, they the, the Broncos asked him to remove that trigger and and uh, the NFLPA got involved that's always that's always a good thing for your team and the NFLPA <laughs> gets involved yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, well I I mean I guess they're, they're going to try to release him um, mm-hmm. or else and they don't want that that trigger to to uh, hit before but uh, I think it was Nick Corte 85 million dollars in dead cap if they release him or trade him before March 17th. Now I remember Philly took ate a big chunk of dead money with Carson Wentz, as did the Rams with Jared Goff. But I don't think there was that I don't think there was that uh yeah. significant. I think it was about 50 million compared to almost 90 million. And that and that's before the uh the the guarantees uh kick in um if he if he's injured. 
Well, he's a, and, and, you know, obviously they hope it won't, but that really makes him a tradable commodity because they're going to be eating a ton of guaranteed money in that contract. And what's the, yeah. they're in salary is probably fairly reasonable in terms of, uh, of what's there. I don't know who would end up paying 37 million as the, the, the roster bonus. Uh, I assume it might be the, 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 well, I guess it depends on when he gets traded, but it gets, it's the fifth year of fifth day of the league year that goes into play. Um, if, you would think that, that it'd be possible to trade a player like that uh, if he's if he's you know got a reasonable salary and he's a quarterback and you're eating the the the, the guaranteed money that came along with that contract in a lot of ways or the signing bonus anyway um, that that could be pretty attractive for some team. Yeah, I agree. I mean, he's definitely regressed from where he was three four years ago, but he's played played better this year than he did last year. And if and if you're only on the hook for the base salary, um, you, we've seen it before. I mean, we saw Wentz and. And golf and how many others uh, get traded? Even uh, Trey, well, he's on a rookie deal, but yeah, we've we've seen it several times. All right, that's just an interesting interesting uh, little tidbit from the news that we wanted to, wanted to hit on. Uh, Voss, always a pleasure to do the show with you. Uh, tell folks where they can find your work online and where they can contact you if they want to talk football. Sure. Well, the pleasure is mine, Ken. Online, I'm on Twitter X at Vasilis Beatdown. V A S I L I S Beatdown. I am co-managing editor and an author for the Baltimore Beatdown blog. And I have another podcast called The Ravens Way Pod at Ravens Way Pod that will live stream every Thursday night around 7 o'clock. All right. Outstanding. Other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, hit me up. DMs are always open on Twitter. I want to hear from you. If you want to do something to support the show, uh, a 50-word five-star review would be much appreciated. Always uh, uh, like that when you can do it, and it helps people find the show because it, it it goes into the algorithms that point people to this podcast, which is always nice and, and hopefully can get us a few more listeners. For Vasilikos, this is Ken McCusick saying goodbye. And we'll talk to you next week on Friday Morning GM. <laughs>